Welcome to Sunday Sermons from the Williamsburg Community Chapel, brought to you by the Chapel Podcast Network. Let's grab our Bibles and open up to the book of Psalms, chapter 22. And I'll read the first two verses for us now as we prepare to hear from lead pastor Travis Simone as he helps us continue to learn and study the discipline of worship. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. It happened. It happened. What I worked so hard to make sure did not happen, happened. My daughter Sophia went to visit her friend Cortland a few weeks ago. And when she returned, she didn't have that happy, smiling face that she has when she usually comes back from Cortland's house. She usually returns giggling and laughing and upbeat. I could tell she was trembling as she came up the front porch and into the living room. She said, Mom and Dad, I I have something I, I have to tell you. I backed over Cortland's mailbox. So there we were in the living room, and I launched into my dad's speech. This is the way you learn how to be careful, Sophia. You got to be careful when you're driving. And maybe this is the easiest way that God could teach you this lesson of how to be a more careful driver. Now, if you don't know, Cortland is the daughter of Hunter Rue, the guy that just introduced our offertory. Thought of all the mailboxes in Williamsburg, it had to be one of my coworkers. And as I went into my dad's speech, Sophia fell into the arms of her mother, not into my arms, and she cried out those words. It happened. It happened. What I worked so hard to make sure did not happen actually happened. See, Sophia, and I asked her permission to tell this story. Driving didn't quite come easily to Sophia. And so she worked hard and she was nervous. She was nervous that something could go wrong and then it did. Can you relate? Maybe there was a marriage and you worked hard to hold that marriage together. And then it happened. It happened. What you worked so hard to make sure did not happen, that marriage dissolved. Maybe it's your children. It happened. You worked so hard to make sure that your, your children knew Jesus Christ deeply. And, and, and they went off on a wayward path to live in the far country with the prodigal son. You said, and you thought, I I did everything right. I worked so hard, I sacrificed so much, and it happened. What I worked so hard to ensure did not happen actually happened. Or maybe it's your health. You took the right vitamins, you did all the exercise, you did all your pre-screenings, and you still got the diagnosis you feared. I think a lot of people in Israel are joining Sophia in her cry lately. We work so hard to protect ourselves. We work so hard to create a a safe place for the Jewish people. And then it, it happened. Everything we worked so hard to make sure did not happen, happened when terrorists invaded our country. Or maybe mothers in Gaza are saying the same thing. We worked so hard to keep our children safe. And now we live in a war zone. And so what do we do? What do we do when what we've worked hard to ensure does not happen, actually happens? Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. 
and by night, but I find no rest. These verses introduce the most famous of all the Psalms of Lament. Lament is the most dominant genre in the book of Psalms. A full third of all the Psalms are Psalms of Lament. And this continues our our series about following Jesus into worship and identifying the biblical elements of worship in the Bible's worship book, the Psalms. We've talked about God's word. We've talked about praise. We've talked about confession. And today we come to the most dominant of all of the perspectives in the Psalter, which is lament. I'm very grateful for contemporary Christian music but we don't get lament very well with contemporary Christian music. The Psalter is not all positive and encouraging. See, when we've worked hard to ensure, excuse me, when we've worked hard to ensure something does not happen and it happens, the Bible's answer for us is to begin lament. Because in lament, we hold our frustration, and our faith together before God. Verse one, again, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? You hear the frustration of abandonment. God, you've left me, combined with the faith of my God. God, even though it feels like you've left me, I'm still holding on. I'm still calling you my God. You see, typically frustration with God leads people to dismiss their faith in God. Or often people who have faith in God feel guilty expressing frustration about God. This dynamic is completely unknown to the book of Psalms. Here we have frustration and faith held together dynamically side by side. Biblical scholar named Dale Bruner commenting on these words writes this, finally, real faith may be calling on God even when experience says God is not there. So how do we do this? How do we lament? How do we be faithful to every element of biblical worship? How do we hold our faith and our frustration together before God? Complain honestly. The honesty of David's complaint is hard to overstate. Where you read in verse one there, these words of my groaning, literally rendered in the Hebrew, it's, roaring words, and he's roaring these words out day and night. God, you're not hearing me by day, and I'm so frustrated, I can't even sleep anyway, so I'm roaring at you at night. These are not pleasant words. These are not really well thought out prayers that David has written neatly on a piece of paper to bring before God. He's shouting. He's crying out. Like a dog barking, I'm roaring at you, God, demanding to know, God, why are you absent? He's not just complaining about what he feels. He wants to get to the deeper issue. God, why is this happening to me? The actual content of the complaint is overwhelmingly honest as well. Look at verses six, seven, and eight on your song sheet but I am a worm and not a man. God, I feel subhuman. All who see me mock me. I'm in trouble, God. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him for he delights in him. God, I'm humiliated. I put my trust in you and all these people out there are are looking at me in humiliation going, he put his trust in the wrong place. Now to show the, the depth of just how honest David's complaint here in this Psalm is, I need to foreshadow the next phase of lament. The next phase of the lament is to petition boldly. 
See, in the book of Psalms, after the honest complaint typically comes a bold petition, and you get that in verse 11. If you look at your song sheet, verse 11, this is David's petition, be not far from me. It's simple prayer. That's what he's asking God for. And yet, after petition, his complaint is so great, he slips right back into it in verse 12. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. So when you're reading the Psalms, you wanna pay attention to the form and then how an author might be breaking the form for different things of emphasis, for different points of, of emphasis. So typically in the Psalms of Lament, it's a linear process. I complain honestly, I petition boldly, but in this particular moment in David's life, he tries to move off of his complaint into petitioning God for what he needs. But his feelings just overwhelm him. He spills right back into complaint. God, I thought I was done, but I've got more to say. Verse 12, many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. God, I'm in danger Verse 14, I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. God, I'm in pain. Verse 15, my strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to my jaws. God, I'm weak. Verse 16, for dogs encompass me, a band of evil doers encircles me. God, I, I'm surrounded. Verse 17, they stare and gloat over me. God, did I mention that I was humiliated? Because the gloating hasn't stopped. The staring hasn't stopped. In verse 18, they divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. God, it's like I'm already dead. This is what happens to a dead man. His clothes are divided up. He doesn't need them in the grave. They're casting lots. Who's gonna get the best items? And worst of all, worst of all, God, it's you. You're the one that's doing this to me. Look at the end of verse 15. You lay me in the dust of death. God, it's your fault. You have the power to save me, and yet you are not. And so what frustration do you need to get honest with God about? What frustration do you need to get really honest with God about? Because in lament, we, we hold our frustration and our faith together before God when we complain honestly and petition boldly. I already foreshadowed this. The petition begins in, in verse 11, where David says, be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. And then David slips back into complaint, but then he slips back into petition in verse 19. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. Same prayer. He comes back to the very same prayer. The two-part honest complaint is matched by a two-part bold petition. What David is frustrated about, he boldly asked God to change. It feels like you're gone, you're gone, God, come home. And again, God, it still feels like you're gone, so please come home. He addresses the danger he is in when he says, deliver my soul from the sword. He speaks of the value of his life in the midst of humiliation when he says, deliver my precious life from the power of the dog. He begs God to alleviate his pain, even though the situation feels as hopeless as being in the mouth of a fierce predator. God, save me. Save me from the mouth of the lion. What I find fascinating about this is in the midst of his frustration with God, David never doubts the power of God to rescue him. See, when we get angry with God, we tend to look for some type of God alternative to rescue us. 
Maybe it's a substance that dulls our senses and, and numbs our emotion. Maybe we, we look for rescue in affirmation in a relationship outside of our marriage or on the internet. Maybe we look for rescue just doubling down and working harder. If I only give it a few more hours, I'll surely be able to save myself. Not David. Not in the form of lament we find in the Psalms. He is convinced that God, even the God who has been absent to this point, is still his only hope for rescue. For David, there is no plan B. So let me ask you this. Who or what God alternative do you need to stop petitioning for help? What bold petition do you need to bring directly before God? Because in lament, we hold our frustration and our faith together before God when we petition him boldly and then trust God completely. This affirmation of trust comes in verse 21. It's part of his final petition when he says, save me from the mouth of the lion, all of a sudden, trust breaks through in the second half of the verse. Look at verse 21. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. In the tiny space of a half verse, it's not even another paragraph or even an, another verse. It's just right between Right between the space of a half verse, it all changes. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. And my question is, what changed? And how did it change? Perhaps David's circumstances changed. Maybe God miraculously intervened. That's possible. Sometimes God operates like that. Perhaps David's perspective changed. You may have heard the old saying, prayer doesn't always change things, but prayer always changes me. Maybe David, in praying this, his, his perspective has somehow been shifted on his circumstances. That's a possibility. But the word rescued in the Hebrew is literally the word for answered. And I think this gives us a clue to what may have actually gone on for David to cry out with this prayer of, of trust, this affirmation of trust. If you were to read it literally, it says, you have answered me from the horns of the wild oxen. It's interesting. It doesn't actually appear that his circumstances have changed or his perspective has changed. He still feels like He's in the middle of the horns of a wild oxen, but while he's in those, while he's caught in the horns of the wild oxen, he claims that God has answered him in this place of trouble. Perhaps God answered his petition, his bold petition, with the truth of his word. And this is how the rescue comes to David. What do I mean answer with the truth of God's word? Well, we were gathered as a staff on Wednesday morning, as we always do for our staff prayer time. And sometimes congregants join us. And during this um, prayer time in this season, we too are, are taking up the psalm, pray the psalms challenge and, and reading through the psalms. And Dale, our associate pastor of groups, was, was leading us, and we were reading Psalm 77. And, and God broke through to my soul in a new way as Dale read these words from Psalm 77, 19. Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. 
The psalm was written by Asaph. We remember him from our sermon a, a few weeks ago. Asaph lived before David, wrote this psalm before David. And Asaph is claiming here, your way, God, is through the sea. Now, in ancient Near Eastern culture, the sea always represents chaos, disorder, even death. And Asaph, inspired by the Holy Spirit, has this profound realization that the way God moves is not to take us around the sea, not to build a tunnel under the sea or to offer us a bridge over the sea, but God's way is through the sea, through the great waters. And then Asaph notes, yet your footprints were unseen. Just because you can't see God rescuing you in the midst of the sea does not mean God is not present, charting the course, not over it, not under it, not around it, but through the sea. And this is the point I've been trying to make in our annual focus, follow me, disciplines for disciples, where the truth that we're studying this entire year is, is that we'll never know who Jesus is until we follow Jesus where he goes. And somehow as Dale read Psalm 77, 19, even though I've been trying to preach it for weeks here on Sunday, the truth broke through. God's way is through the sea and his footprints are there even when I can't see them. I believe something like this is what happened to David as he prayed. Some aspect of the truth of God's word broke through to his soul in a new way. And so my question here, as we, as we look at this piece of lament to trust God completely, my question is, will you join the Pray the Psalms challenge? I know some of our church has taken it up. I know some of our church has yet to take it up. I know some of our church has taken it up and feels like a failure for not doing it well. Let it all start fresh today. God breaks through to our souls in his word. I believe our church could be greatly transformed if we together were praying the Psalms. We've added some booklets over to a table over there. You can get the booklet at wcchapel.org slash follow me. But will you join this challenge and ask God to drive his word more deeply into your heart? And maybe you're out there saying, trust God completely. Travis, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know my pain. You don't know my hurt. You don't know what I worked so hard to make sure did not happen and then it happened. And you're right, I don't. I don't know everyone's story gathered for worship here today. But God does. And on the cross, Jesus cried out these words. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Have you felt like your life has descended into darkness? like you've been abandoned, like something in your life is pierced through or dried up, God in and as Jesus Christ has experienced that too. And what does Jesus do in this moment of utter darkness? He laments. He holds the frustration, pain, violence, grief, and loss of the world together with faith in God's rescuing power. He holds it all together. It's quite interesting how Matthew records Jesus's words in Matthew 27. He actually records Jesus's words in, in two different languages. Eli, Eli is Hebrew, and Lama Sabachthani is Aramaic. And I think Matthew is doing two things here. 
The first part of the quote being Hebrew is the exact Hebrew words that start Psalm 22. Eli, Eli, my God, my God. And Matthew is pushing you back to consider Psalm 22. Lama Sabachthani is Aramaic, the language that Jesus spoke. And Matthew is saying, look back at Psalm 22. And by the way, this is exactly what Jesus said. When Jesus was cut, he bled scripture. This is a point uh, one of our associate pastors, Rich Sylvester, was making to me all week. He was just fascinated by this. When, when Jesus is pierced through, when, the, when, the, when, when Jesus is hanging on the cross, when he's in the darkest moment of his life, what emerges out of his soul is nothing but the word of God itself. As disciples of Jesus Christ, the whole goal is to become like Jesus. If you want to become like Jesus, pray the Psalms. When he was cut, he bled scripture. And quoting the first verse of a line of a Psalm is how they referenced the entire Psalm in the first century. They they didn't have books where they could turn pages. They didn't have chapters and verses. And so they would quote the first line and it would point you back to the whole thing. Jesus cries these words out at the sixth hour. His death is at the ninth hour. It's like he had three hours where he's just chewing on, meditating on, working through all of Psalm 22. And in verse 24, we read these things. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He has not hidden his face from him, but has heard his cry for help. See, Psalm 22, written maybe a thousand years before Jesus, prophetically points forward to this most crucial moment in all of human history. Jesus on the cross David prophetically speaks, they have have pierced my hands and feet. They divide my garments among them. And they cast lots for my clothing. Jesus is crying out, don't you see? David said this very thing would happen about me. But if you think God has forsaken this moment, oh no. Verse 24 says, he has not hidden his face from him. He has heard him when he cried for help. My advisor from seminary who came and helped us with the, the summer sermon series, Brent Strawn, he, he wrote a commentary on the book of Psalms. He, he said this, if Jesus intended us to hear all of Psalm 22 in his mouth on the cross, the cry of dereliction becomes terribly misnamed. Cry of trust or affirmation of faith would be much better. If so, one must no longer think of divine abandonment because he did not despise, abhor, hide his face, but of divine deliverance because he heard. For anyone who feels like they cannot trust God completely, I want you to hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can trust the God who entered into your pain. You can trust the God who held frustration and faith together even at death's door. You see, Jesus' death defeated the ultimate darkness, which is sin and its consequence, death. His resurrection demonstrates he is the way to new life. Through faith in Jesus Christ, our greatest frustrations and pain become the doorway to the life that is truly life. And if you've never trusted completely, you can place your complete trust in Jesus Christ, the ultimate rescuer right now, which will lead you to the final step in lament. When we complain honestly, petition boldly and trust completely, we can praise expansively. You see, praise and pain are not incompatible as most people think. In lament, God moves us through pain to praise. 
Look at verses 22 through 23 and then verse 27. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. Verse 27, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before you. Notice the expanding circles of David's praise after he trusts God completely. He starts praising God with his brothers his most intimate family connections. He, he then moves to praising God with the congregation, a, a group of people just like us gathered to worship God together. Then he moves to the people of Israel, brothers, congregation, nation. But that's not big enough because in verse 27, he goes to the very ends of the earth, all of the families of the world before you, Lord, praising together. It's an expansive praise that David engages in. But the expansion continues. If the ends of the earth and all the families of the world are not enough, David says in verse, tw in, uh, verse 29 and 31, these words, all the prosperous of earth shall eat and worship before him. They shall bow down, all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Verse 31, they shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, for he has done it. Did you catch the imagery there? All who go down to the dust are praising him. Generations yet to come, a people yet unborn are praising him. The expansion continues to people who are dead and people who are yet to be born. Death can't prevent us from praising the Lord because the praise is not just expansive, it's eternal and it goes on forever. To people who are not even yet born, they start praising God in the psalm. And so Sophia's there with us saying, how could this have happened? I worked so hard to make sure it did not happen. And I said, Sophia, you're gonna have to call Hunter and tell him what happened. And Hunter received the phone call with such graciousness. He said, how are you? Are you okay? And I told her to call Hunter because I knew Hunter would have some type of gracious response that's just the kind of guy he is. Ultimately, Hunter spent some time fixing the mailbox with his dad at no cost to Sophia. And when he told her about how he fixed the mailbox, he assured her that he understood. He understood what she was feeling as he recounted the story of himself as a teenager backing the car out of the garage before the garage door was completely opened at his house. I'm sure you'll hear that in a sermon from Hunter one day soon. But Hunter was able to offer that grace and to hear Sophia's cry for help because he understood what she was feeling in the moment. He had been through that same thing with his parents. So whatever your frustration is, Know that God understands. Know that he desires to hear from you. He desires to help you process your pain. And in the Psalms, in biblical worship, he gave us a tool. The tool is called lament, where we can complain honestly, petition boldly, trust completely, and then turn to praise our God expansively and eternally as we hold our frustration and our faith together before God. Thank you for joining us today. Here at the Williamsburg Community Chapel, we are all about making disciples of Jesus Christ. So wherever you are in your spiritual journey, we hope you will take up this call of Jesus to follow me as we consider these disciplines for 
disciples. 